Commissioner Teague, it's all yours. Crystal. Okay. I guess we're ready to get started again. Commissioner Ripley has a question. Chuck, um, with regard to Virginia, has there been a spread of CWD within that state? From the four states? Yeah, no, from the original counties. So I, I may have to refer to, to James Kelly on exactly the year that Virginia uh, found CWD for the first time, but if I'm not mistaking, the uh, original detection counties have remained the same since they first found it. I believe it's a four county area, but they have found uh, new positives in those original counties recently, but uh, to your point or your question, uh, the, uh, the original counties have not changed. Okay, and, and secondly, you told us that uh, there are 10 states that have closed importation to all other states, correct? They, they well, it, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with your terminology. What, what's happened in 10 states is, is that, that they're requiring that these carcass importation guidelines be followed from all deer and elk being, all deer and elk carcasses being brought into their state. Right. How many, um, how many states are following option B? That is, the, the <clears throat> banned, banned them completely from positive states. Let me drive back to the comprehensive graphic, if you well, will. Well, not, not banned, but, but implemented the carcass restrictions. Let me see if I can summarize this. So you have 10 states that are taking the all states approach, which was option A. You have 14 states that aren't taking any action on this or requiring anything. You've got 17 states that are uh, doing what the agency recommendation is for Tennessee. Okay, that's that answered my question. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. The question was, what do the stars mean? Thank you for asking that. The stars are to signify very recent changes. And this is something that's changing weekly across the nation. A lot of people are looking at this. So in the states with stars, those are, starts that have take, uh, those are states that have taken recent action. In Minnesota, an executive order by the governor uh, was ordered and to go to the uh, all states. And then in Louisiana, currently they have out for co uh, public comment uh, for all states. And then in Alabama, they just changed to what our agency recommendation is. I got one more question. If um, if we do the agency recommendation of shutting down any positive state, and you and you still go to work with the Department of Agriculture to develop the program so that we could get certified taxidermists and processors to do some testing, is there any chance at that time once we get that program, is it would it be an enforcement nightmare to then allow servants being brought from outside the state that were not um, I mean, with their carcass intact, if they were going straight to, is there some way that we could give them a free pass to a, so that, to a taxidermist that we could then uh, get that data from where that deer came from and have it tested so that we can kind of get an idea on these other states if there is, you know, encroachment of like Virginia now in Southwest Virginia, that sort of thing. Is there something we could go back or would that be an enforcement nightmare to, to to have that 
um, intact. Do you understand my question? I do, and, and let me clarify something that I think will, uh, <coughs> that may do away with your question, but if, if the question remains, I defer to one of the law enforcement leaders to provide that comment. Or can I pick the one you asked? Or, or response. <laughs> I, I imagine you can. Just kidding. So uh, as a matter of clarification, if, if, we, if, if there were to be the development of a regulation, with, either by us or the Department of Ag someday, that required people bringing deer or elk carcasses into Tennessee from non-positive areas, that they be required to have those animals sampled once they get here, that would not change the re current requirement that they bring them in uh, deboned, et cetera, from positive areas. So if that program were to come to fruition, uh, I, I don't think that changes um, the enforcement uh, scenario. So you're saying a state that's got a positive ID already, or positive county, Regardless, if we have that program in place or not, they're still going to have to debone their and take the carcass out. That's right. But what would be new would be in the non-positive areas, we would require that they have them pos have them tested once they get here, or they default to meeting the requirements. Okay. But I, I still want to see, and I'm going to be gone obviously when this plane goes. But I'd love to see in-state deer being tested because I mean there, I don't think there's a good across the country a good means of, of, of data of, 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 of the uh, disease itself. And you know, when you start reading closely about it, you gotta be concerned about bird droppings. You, hay, are we gonna allow hay to come into our state? I mean, you know, if we're talking about little increments, you start adding them all up, and it's gonna be um, uh, very, um, very involved and, 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 and create a lot more um, problems um, with the, um, with the, the business inter interest of, of our state. So I'm just saying, you just, I guess it's just how far do we go? I mean, how, you know, and that's just, I, but I would like to see us be, we test it within the state and outside too. If I may, let me pause just a moment and, and ask uh, Chief Ryder, are, are you good with the enforcement component of that? I, I, if you're okay, I'm okay. I just wanted to give you that opportunity if there's thoughts. I am, that's exactly what I feel. I think B's the option that both the agency has recommended. And, and it, if you went back to that chart, enforceability level comes up, the prevention comes up, your seriousness, your passion is in play. And I think your, the volunteer piece is, is there, that that dialogue has already been started with uh, the Department of Agriculture. So I think all those components come into play. And that, I think that's where you're at. Did I answer that question? I don't know if you understood my question, but you answered it. <laughs> I mean, what you got, you got problematic in those components of Virginia. If, it, if all these deer show up with confirmation numbers, you got to dig in. It, it's difficult, whereas if the positive states in its entirety, it's cleaner, it's simpler. Do you think we could get Trump to build a wall to keep Virginia deer out of town? With that kind of money, absolutely. We'll make Virginia pay for it, okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Any more discussion? Do we have to ask the public? No one has any reason that agency shouldn't go forward with their proposal. I think you've got somebody from the audience who might want to say something. Anyone from the audience would like to discuss? Mm -hmm. Just please state your name for the microphone and audience at home there is one. I'm Todd Godsey and uh, I run a taxidermy shop I employ about five taxidermists uh, <laughs> you know I got a question with the, the TWRA what their goals are for their for their deer herd you know I don't who do I address that to or okay Okay, that was my question. What's the TWRA's gold on their on their deer? What what's the gold on your on your herd? What are you trying to do for your herd or 
you know. Specifically pertaining to? The management and the CWD and, and stuff like that. I guess we're, we're, in, we're having a discussion on CWD, so if you could help us hone in on the CWD component of your question, we greatly okay. appreciate it. My, my component on the CWD, uh, it's a natural source, uh, a natural disease that is nature that controls your deer herd, okay? So you, you all are talking about carcasses and stuff like that, bringing them into the state of Tennessee. This is a prion that goes into the soil, it goes into the hay, your grain, your, your soil that you transport from out of states, any of these states that have, that you bring this in from. You know, you're talking about shutting down, uh, bringing deer into the state of Tennessee that's deboned and uh, have been uh, caped out and all this stuff. Well, you're gonna go to another state, they're gonna set up out here, they're gonna charge you $80 to debone this deer and to cape it out and stuff like that, well, that adds on another charge. If you're gonna mount that deer, you're gonna bring it to my shop, well, that's $80 on top of what I'm charging. What I guess what I'm getting at is it kind of looks like it's your uh, out-of-state deer is like 70% of my business, you know, from where I'm located. So it's just, you know, it's, it's chopping me down at the knees when, when you go to cutting something like this out, you know, bringing these deer and stuff in. You may have given it, and forgive me, we should have asked in the beginning, could we get your name and, and your address, just for the record, not to come look I'm you up. <laughs> I'm Todd Gotze, and I'm with Bigfoot's Taxidermy, and I'm in Bluntville, Tennessee. Bluntville, thank you so okay. much, sir. And, and the reason I asked that question about what the TWRA's goal was, was for their deer, I have some notes, which are not very good, but, you know, on some of these states that's had this CWD disease, you know, a lot of people, you're treating this CWD disease like it's uh, rabies and they're going to, these deer are going to start foaming at the mouth and stuff, you know, and, and it's, this prion, it's a deadly killer. It will kill the deer in the study that, I, that I've read and stuff, you know, but then you look here at you've got Alberta, Colorado, Illinois, Kansas, Maryland, Michigan, Missouri, Montana, New Mexico, Nebraska, all these states have had CWD. Well, a lot of us as hunters, we pay big money to go to these states and hunt trophy deer. So it's not if we're going to get CWD, it's when are we going to get it. How, how, you're not going to stop it by allowing these deer carcasses to come into the state of Tennessee because you've got grain coming in, you've got hay coming in, you're transporting dirt into the state. I mean, and a crow is a, a, a spreader of this disease. If he eats a carcass and he goes out here and, and uh, you know, uses the bathroom in a hay field, it, that prawn's in the dirt. I mean, it's, you know, if you do more research and studying on this disease, it, it's very serious. And I know we don't want to open up the doors to it because I'm in business. If this disease comes in and wipes out the deer herd, I'm out. You know, I'm done. That's 70% of my business is deer, is, is mounting deer. But you start doing something like this and, and not letting people have to debone their deer and, and cape them out and stuff like that, they're not going to go to our meat processors. I had very little time, you know, to get prepared for this meeting. And I, I called several people, and, and I've talked to several uh, politicians and stuff, and they, they say, you know, not all out, but they say, well, you're crazy. They're not going to pass something like this. They're not going to ban deer coming into the state of Tennessee unless they've been deboned. And, and the carcass, it's going to happen. It's it's going to be passed. I, I mean, I, I feel like that's that's what's going to happen by listening to to y'all talk about it and stuff. But you know, this is a disease that's nature that's controlling the herd that only the strong survive. And I just listed you counties that's had this disease that are trophy counties. So really, what are we trying to do? I know we don't want to wipe our deer herd out, but yet you know. It seems like that the, that the taxidermists, the meat cutters, we're going to take the blunt end of this whenever you cut out this, you know, bringing the deer into the state of Tennessee. If they've been deboned and skinned and caped out, they're not going to go to a meat processor and have them cut up. They done been deboned. Why should they? You know, so that's going to cut them out. You know, it's just it's going to affect a lot of people. It's something that needs to be to thought of. I mean, just like I said, it's not uh, if we're going to get it, it's when it's going to happen. 
So. May I ask a question, the gentleman, <clears throat> Mr. Godsey? Uh, what percentage of the deer that you that you do are from 70%, other states? Over seventy percent of the deer from over states are from other states. Other states. So yes. only thirty percent of your business is, is working on Tennessee. Yes. Deer. Yes, it is. You know, and this is something else that I don't even want to mention, and, and I hate to mention it. And one little man on my shoulder says, just let it go, and, but yet I'm, I'm going to mention this. There, you know, just like on some of the studies that I've done, you know, I might have known my phone would leave me now. But anyway, on, on some of this that I've read about, you know, there's some, there's some federal grant money out here that's to be had. For this, disease, for this disease, the study on this disease. And you know, there's an alternative motive for passing this, not letting deer come into the state of Tennessee. You're creating a deal to where a guy's hunting up here in Ohio, if Ohio's banned and they can't bring them in from Ohio, I'm just using that as an example. He's hunting in Ohio, he's hunting till dark, he kills a deer, he's gonna bring it back to the state of Tennessee, he's gonna have it mounted. Well, is he gonna get it deboned and caped out? He's gotta be at work at, you know, in the morning no he's going to throw that deer in the back of the truck throw a tarp over it he's going to bring it into the state of tennessee and then he's going to check it in on the phone and there you go so you're creating a way unless you know when your twra official catches him bringing that deer into the state then he's created a fee so there's an ulterior i feel like there's an ulterior motive you know whether it be some federal grant money to create a a crisis on this cwd but let's go back this prion is, is a killer to the deer. Only the, the strong survive, and the TWRA have done a tremendous job in stocking the deer. Such a good job in, in their stocking program that they can't control it. That they can't control the deer herd. We drove from Blountville down to here, probably seen at least 10 deer in the road hit, you know, by cars and stuff. We have got a tremendous deer herd, and they have moved into the urban part the subdivisions and, and you know we've it was it was you know when I was doing taxidermy work I'm still doing taxidermy work but when I was a kid doing it it was you, you didn't shoot a doe that was just unheard of nobody killed any does or anything like that now I mean look at what we've got what kind of herd we've got and are we going to be able to if we do find this CWD how are we going to medicate these deer we can't round them all up and put them in a corral and give them a shot <laughs> You know, what, what's the answers? If we had all those, we'd, we'd just get rid of it all together and we wouldn't be here. But Well, this prion is, is the answer. I appreciate your comments. I'm let me ask you a quick question. I feel like it's getting okay. a little... Mr. Chairman, let me ask you a question. If you had a year but from now, because I think it's going to get closed, whether it's now or a year from now, whatever. If you had a year, would you be better prepared? What would you do differently? To help your business if it's going to cut 70 percent of your business out would a year help you move oh, I've something done, to virginia or to oh, process I've done made or arrangements whatever? i've done major arrangements i'm going to survive in this one way or another i've done made arrangements i mean i i i'm, I'm just a taxidermist I'm, I'm just an old country boy i mean i got a knife i'll travel i'll leave their carcasses up there in virginia somewhere you know and they can deal with it but you know what i mean I've, I've got to survive i've got five people that work for me and, and and five families and it's got you know it's it's got me tore up and worried and i'm not a very good speaker but you know i just that's where i'm at with it and i try to get more I, i've got a, like a facebook with my business and i had over 200 hits i posted an article about this and i had over 200 hits i had a hard time finding out about this the meeting and stuff I called Marshtown, nobody knowed anything about it. I called down here, you know, and I, I got to set in on the one in, in, in June there, in which it's kind of scary to get up here and talk to you fellas after setting in on that meeting, you know, it was on the phone, you know, it's kind of it's kind of intimidating, but. Scared uh, us too. Yeah. We're a lot, we're a lot better looking on the phone, aren't we? Uh, yeah, you, you look a lot better in person, I, I'll tell you. But I guess that's all I have to say, you know, I just, it, it needs some study and some thought into it. And, and there again, you know, I go back and I look at these states that's had this chronic waste disease like this New Mexico and this Colorado and, and, and Illinois and Kansas. And I mean, I lay my hands on these trophies all, all the time, every day, you know, and, and they have a trophy deer and the strong survive. And, you know, I guess that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. So obviously, everybody up here takes this very seriously. We've had a 
we've uh, just had discussions upon discussions, and it's difficult when there's not a the right answer is not an easy one. And, it, and definitely, we're trying to weigh the risk and uh, what steps we can take. A lot of the things that are being discussed today, I think we're all in agreement with, with looking at every way we can affect um, the spread or the stop the spread of this disease. Uh, I think the importation, the carcass importation is something that's unique, something we actually do have control over. There's a lot of other variables that we don't. I think we need to work with other departments to let help us deal with this, but um, I don't think anybody thinks that we, we got the, um, you know, the kryptonite for it, but, you know, I think we need to look a hard look at, take a hard look at what we have the ability to do right now. Is there someone else? Yes, sir. State your name, please. If you're representing the organization, say that, please. My name is Dr. Clayton Mullins. Uh, I received a biology degree from the East Tennessee State University in 1987 with a concentration in wildlife biology. So I do have a little bit of understanding on uh, field studies and prions and such. Um, I was asked to come here today to kind of speak on that. Um, and and I'll, I, I appreciate ladies and gentlemen of the, of the commission allowing me to speak here. Um, and I am not a public speaker, so you'll have to bear with me as well. Uh, a prion, I don't know how extensively somebody has explained what a prion is, but a prion is not a bacteria or a virus. Uh, you know, as most people understand bacteria or viruses, uh, if they're left out or exposed to some kind of killing agent, they die. You know, viruses left out of the host will die in a certain amount of time, like AIDS or if you have uh, a hepatitis laying, laying around on something, over a period of time exposure to sunlight will kill it. Bacteria, antibiotics kills it. A prion is a mutated protein. It is, a, it is something that doesn't die easily. It's not readily uh, cleansed from the soil very easily. Uh, a prion, uh, like I said, it's a mutated protein. And from what studies I have read, uh, it looks like it can contaminate soil. It can come up through the soil, through the roots of the plant, and contaminate the vegetation all the way up to the, the point of the grain. So as, as Todd Gotze was referring to the, 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 the grains and the, and the, and the uh, grass, uh, th that is permanently uh, contaminated until that goes out. And so if a deer eats that, it gets that. Now, uh, the prion that we're talking about, there are several prions. There's, there's prions in every species, even humans. Uh, but they're not cross, they're, they don't cross species boundaries. So the prion that we're addressing here today is for uh, the deer, the, the white tail specifically, the white, the, the uh, mule deer, and the elk. And it, as far as I can find, there are no studies that show that there's any cross-species contamination. So in other words, humans can't con con contact or, or, or contract it, nor can any other animal contract that particular prion. But it can be, this particular prion can be spread by other, other species. Uh, from what I've found, the common black crow uh, th there's been an extensive study on the crow. As we all know, we see them along the road. What happens when a deer gets hit? Within just 30 minutes or so, the crows find that carcass. And that's the same way it is in the woods. When, a, when these deer die from this chronic wasting disease, the first, the first ones on the scene are the crows and the vultures. They find these carcasses and they, and they eat this. And, by, and when they eat this, uh, I can't I, I, I came unprepared. I should have brought everybody a copy of this study, but there's been an extensive study. Uh, th these crows migrate from, from uh, north to south, just like other birds do, and there's roosting areas. And uh, these scientists have taken upon themselves to do studies of the uh, feces under these roosting areas. And in, in, in all cases where they did these studies, that prion is present. In that, in our, in that, it's the white tail one. It's it, that's the one that's present in under those roosting areas. So to think that 
by stopping the transportation of any kind of deer carcass or anything like there's no there's no way like Dr. McMillan referred to, let's build a wall around the state of Tennessee. Well, you'd also have to put a fly pen across the state of Tennessee because the common black crow is the main vector of this disease. And it's, it's well documented that it goes through the digestive system of this crow readily and it's not harmed. It's still very viable once it, once it comes through their digestive system. So a crow could eat contaminated material in, in our northern states Today and day after tomorrow, he will be here and he will be defecating here and spreading this disease. So to think that we can stop this, it, it's ludicrous. We, this, is a, this is mother nature at its finest. This is, this is an act of natural selection. The, the research that I did and the studies where I found that those states that he had up there on the, on the screen, if you'll look, the concentration of deer densities in those areas is 35 plus per square mile. That's excessive concentrations. One area was 74 deer, 74 plus deer per square mile. Could you imagine a square mile of, of land having a concentration of 74 deer? I mean, you'd be tripping over them. Our, our average concentration around here is somewhere around six to eight deer per square mile. That's our average, our average concentration. So what's happening is you're looking at mother nature running her course. To think that TWR, now TWR has done a great job stocking these deer, but to think that you can control the deer population, I know, I know they've talked about stocking, you know, uh, bears and, and you, you talk sorry, about- I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you specifically stay on the subject of CWD? I'm, I am on the it's subject of CWD. It's not a population discussion right now. Well, but you're talking about controlling <laughs> CWD as if it's a bad thing. What makes you think CWD is a bad thing? Well, what makes you think CWD is a bad thing is because of the science that's been presented to you. CWD is not a bad thing. It's a population controller. You don't see CWD in areas where the population is less than 10 deer per square mile. You, you see it in areas where they're overpopulated. I raise cattle. I don't know if anybody else in here does, but there's only so many cattle that can be held on a certain piece of ground. It's usually two, two cattle per square acre. I mean, yeah, per, per acre. If you put 10, 10 cows on an acre, they get diseases too. That's what's happening in Mother Nature right now. This, this prion has come in to control the deer herd. It's not, the prion is not a bad thing. It's just Mother Nature doing what she's supposed to do. And for us as humans to think that we're gonna control this, it's ludicrous. Just like Dr. McMillan said, you're gonna build a wall I own property in Virginia and Tennessee, and I am from Zone 4. There where you saw all that concentration of Virginia hunters bringing deer down into Tennessee, I'm one of those. I have proof, last year I killed a nice trophy buck on my farm in Tennessee that I have on a trail cam on a farm in Virginia. It's the same exact deer. That thing walked eight miles to come to my, to my farm in Tennessee where I killed it. I couldn't believe it. So those deer are coming out of Virginia no matter what you do. You can pass all the regulations and everything you want to do. You're not going to stop the influx of these deer into our, in our county. They're walking here. So to pass some sort of regulation that inhibits, what, what you're going to do by passing this is you're going to put a heavy burden on the hunter, just like Mr. Godsey said. You're putting such a burden on us that Deer that I would normally bring home, I'm, a, I'm an avid hunter. I love to hunt. I'm, I'm an avid fisherman. I hunt, I hunt Kansas, I hunt uh, Kentucky, I hunt Virginia, I hunt Ohio, I hunt all these states. I probably am guilty of mounting deer that I shouldn't have mounted, but they have significance to me when I kill them. They're not necessarily a big trophy. But by passing some kind of ordinance like this, it's gonna make me think twice when I'm in the state of Ohio and I kill an eight pointer that I might have brought back to Mr. Godsey's taxidermy shop when I see what kind of hassle I go through. And I just, I just experienced this this year, the friend of mine that went sir, with me sir, in Ohio. Me. 
it's going would to you, cause such my, a burden to would, me. If you wrap up, thank you so much. Yeah, it's going to cause such a burden to me because I have to find someone to process that deer in Ohio and pay the $80 up there that it took us this past year to, pro, to, to get that thing ready to bring back to Tennessee, that it's going to influence me to where I, I will not bring my deer back to Mr. Godsey. So it's going to hurt taxidermy businesses. Uh, it's going to hurt the meat cutting business because I'm not likely to, ha to bring the carcass back. So my, my, my point is, please consider what you're fixing to do. It, there's no documented cases of transmission of this disease by way of a carcass being brought in. There is, there is none. I challenge anybody that says that there is to prove that. There are no examples of transmission of this disease by way of a, of a contaminated carcass. So you're, you're making a decision based on, some, based on something that's, that's uh, hypothetical, okay? The, the, the state, this thing's been known since Sir, 19... please, let's, well, let's, let's bring this to a close. I would like to go ahead and finish my presentation. I've been trying to get you there, so <laughs> uh, please bring it to a closure or you can sit down, one or the other. Okay, I'll just sit down. Thank you. I would like it on record that I was told to stop too. With due respect, sir, you made that choice, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Yeo speak to us about the effects uh, as, as they have been experienced in other states in terms of, you know, is it, does this disease simply thin the population or is there a more devastating uh, result. And I, well, the, the areas that have high prevalence, in other words, CWD is a, is a big deal affecting a lot of deer and elk. In those areas, the animals live long enough to replace themselves, okay? But the, but the, the age structure of those animals is younger um, than what we currently have in Tennessee because when they grow older, they're more likely to be impacted by the disease and succumb to the uh, consequences of it. Now, as far as population impacts in other states or areas that have a lot of chronic wasting disease, a couple of instances in um, Wyoming and Colorado, biologists have witnessed uh, coincident mule deer population declines of up to 30 50 percent and then um, the prevalence rates in some areas of the west and west constant are getting so high that it's it's almost harder to shoot a deer that does not have CWD than one that that does so it's a it's a really big issue there and those are some of the states that people you know consider destination states I mean, it obviously is a really big issue because we have a, almost all of the states in the union dealing with it in some way or another. So it's, it's, it's something of great concern. Chuck, uh, Arkansas is one of the states that has a complete ban. How long has that ban been in effect? Do you know? Was it in effect prior to them finding CWD? I am not sure. Can any, is it? I'll Brad, invite Brad Miller up to address that. And, and while he's coming, I, my only other comment is that I think, I think ultimately we're going to have to do this. I wish we would wait another year to give these, some of these businesses time to react and maybe figure out, let the public be aware. I think you know, doing it a month before season opens or six weeks before season opens, I think is pretty quick. Out of, out of respect for the chairman, I guess I should ask if it's okay for Brad to address that question. Sure, I think we past that point by now. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Brad Miller, your new elk coordinator. Nice to meet y'all. Um, I was in Arkansas working for the Game of Fish at the time that CWD was detected in Missouri. And we had a lot of these same discussions um, at that time. Um, it was found in northern Missouri when I was there. And we had a, an interstate that we debated. You know, do we say, OK, carcasses from north of this interstate uh, need to fall under the importation regs, carcasses south, uh, just come on in as, as normal. Um, after back and forth, we, we decided to do a whole state ban so that if 
you bring a carcass in from Missouri, it needs to be deboned and clean skull plate and all those kind of things. Um, at the same time, it was found in Texas, and we uh, elected to do a complete ban of Texas. And we also uh, took one more step to address this by notifying hunters from Arkansas that had bought big game tags in those states, and we sent them postcards that said, hey, um, there's a new regulation in place. If you go back to Missouri to hunt, you kill an animal, you need to follow these carcass importation guidelines.